the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Pet Cemetery, released in 1989 and based on the 1983 Stephen King novel. I read Pet Cemetery last year when I heard about the upcoming remake. It's really depressing. In fact, it wasn't even published until five years after King wrote it, since he was so reluctant to have such a dark story released. I absolutely loved it, but this 1989 screen adaptation? Eh, not so much. You'd think that with a screenplay by Mr. King himself, it'd be just as good as the memorably morose source material. But instead, the movie kinda just lurches around like the undead beings it depicts, staggering from plot point to plot point until we finally get to the admittedly cool final sequence. Pet Cemetery is about a doctor named Lewis Creed who's just moved his family to Ludlow, Maine. Their property includes a path to a pet cemetery, where family animals have been buried by generations of grieving children. A dead pet is one of the saddest things I can think of, but as we'll hear many times throughout this movie, Sometimes, that is better. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that Fred Gwynn, Herman Frickin' Munster, plays Lewis's neighbor Judd Crandall. He's the best part of the movie, especially the way he does Judd's heavy main accent that was a big part of the character in the book. Yeah. How many victims will this movie put in the ground? Let's find out and get to the kills, I uh... The movie begins in the titular pet cemetery, which has gotta be the most depressing place you can think of. Just a bunch of dead kitty cats and good boys? No thank you. Especially since this one's got a serious singing kid problem. It's getting late there, kids. Don't you gotta get home to Danny Elfman? The pet cemetery is near this house that was recently sold to the Creed family. Lewis Creed is a doctor who just got a job at the University of Maine. He's played by Dale Midkiff, who kicks off this role with a Bill Lumberg impersonation. Yeah. His wife, Rachel, is played by Denise Crosby, you know, from one of those Star Treks. And together, they have a flippy daughter, Ellie, and an adorable two-year-old named Gage. Oh, and a cute gray kitty cat named Church. Can you say Church, Gage? Cat. Good boy! Aw, oh, what a happy family. Ellie has a minor tire swing accident, and while her parents are tending to her scraped up knee, baby boy Gage gets a little too friendly with the trucks on the road. In fact, this precocious poopy butt walks straight into the road, and might have been squashed if not for Judd Crandall, the Creed family's new neighbor. They thank him for his baby scooping and ask him about a trail they've discovered on their property. Uh, yeah, that's a good story. A good walk. I'll take you up there sometime. Later that night, Lewis goes over to Judd's house to share a beer and watch the trucks go by. Yeah. That's one mean road, all right. They talk about the road and how that trail leads to a pet cemetery. And honestly, the huge chasm in acting ability here is almost painful to watch. There's that damn road. Uses up a lot of animals. Dogs and cats, mostly. My little girl's got a cat. Winston Churchill. Call him Church for short. Oh, sorry, what were you saying about Churchill there, dude? I nodded off trying to listen to you. Yeah, Dale Midkiff seems like a nice enough dude, but his performance as Lewis Creed kinda sinks this movie for me. It doesn't help that he's in so many scenes right alongside Fred Gwynn being the best. The next day, as promised, Judd takes the Creeds up the trail to the pet cemetery. Rachel immediately hates the place because she's got some hangups about death. I mean, who doesn't, right? But Judd reckons that kids gotta learn about death somehow, I uh. He even buried his own dog, Spot, here in 1924. Cool graveyard, Judd, but what's with that deadfall over there? Or should I say undeadfall? Dun dun dun! The cemetery trip gets Ellie scared about Church dying, so hopefully this dude can convince his daughter that Church will be fine. Honey, Church will be fine. Yeesh. Ain't nobody buying it with that sales technique. No wonder she ends up crying about it. What the fuck ever, though. Ellie gets to go to sleep with Church tucked in right next to her? What? <laughs> That's the cutest thing I've ever seen. Lucy, why don't you do that at bedtime? To make Church less of a wildcat, the Creeds intend to get him castrated, even though Ellie's against it. I don't want Church to get his nuts cut, Daddy. <laughs> she said nuts. Apparently she learned that kind of language from Missy, the Creed's housekeeper, who has plenty of reason to swear since she's got a bad case of stomach cancer. She refuses Lewis's offer to take a look at it, though, and he leaves for his first day at work after kissing his wife and adorable son goodbye. I kissed you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Wow, that is one cute baby. Too bad Lewis's first day at work is a disaster, since this teenager named Victor Pascal was brought into his office with half his frickin' head still back there on the sidewalk. Yeah, this kid is deader than a possum's playtime. I mean, Lewis even does the movie eye-closing thing. And look, you can see his frickin' gyri and shit. Yup, 100% definitely a kill. <laughs> 
don't worry, I wasn't wrong. Victor's just popping in from the afterlife real quick to tell Lulu that the soil of a man's heart is stonier, whatever that means. And he's not done ghosting around yet, cause later that night, Lewis gets a midnight hour wake up call. Come on, Doc. We've got places to go. Lewis reluctantly follows the ghost boy in short shorts out to the trail, where they're piping in a fog machine real nice and evenly. Great work there, G&E. When they get to the pet cemetery, Victor instructs Lewis never to go further to where the dead walk. Y yeah, and that blue zone back there. We color-coded it so you could see it better. Lewis crumples to the ground as Victor floats away with a warning. The barrier was not meant to be crossed. And then Lewis wakes up. I bet he's thinking it was all just a dream, huh? Yeah, maybe if dreams left your feet dirty, idiot. Yeah, you grab that hair in mild confusion. Eventually, it's Thanksgiving season, and Lewis is staying home while Rachel takes the kids to her parents' house without him, because apparently his in-laws just don't like him that much. I can see why, though. First thing this dude does when he's in bachelor mode is to dress up like an Adam Sandler SNL character. He gets a call from Judd to come over, because his cat may have gotten hit by a truck. Aw, oh, man, I hope that's not the case. That would be a very emotional moment for anybody. Yep. That church, all right. <laughs> or I guess just an everyday matter of fact. I'll spare you the shot of Lewis peeling his dead cat off the frozen ground because nobody likes to see a dead cat. Least of all Ellie, who Lewis knows is gonna be a wreck when she finds out. Judd feels bad just thinking of how sad she's gonna be, so he says that maybe does a better way. He takes Lewis to the pet cemetery and says that they're headed to the blue zone. Whoa, oh, just yonder over that land dam there, are ya? Lewis is reluctant because of his dream zombies warning, but he follows Judd anyway because, come on, who wouldn't want to hang out with Fred Gwynn as much as possible? During their lengthy journey through the woods, they hear a big old scary monster growl. But Judd dismisses it as just a loon, that's all. That growl is probably a nod to the Wendigo, the being that cursed these burial grounds in the book. Hopefully the Wendigo will have a bigger part in the remake coming out. Judd takes Lewis to what he says is a Micmac Indian burial ground. And although the whole concept of Indian burial grounds has some issues with it, be sure to check out our podcast on the matter with special guest Joey Cliff. At least this place looks cool, I guess? Production had to make it using bulldozers on a mountaintop, so no wonder they invested in these sweet aerial shots. Lewis is told that you have to bury your own. So while Judd sits by and smokes a whole pack of cigs, Lewis spends all night digging in the stony soil until he can finally plant his bag of cat. Don't forget to water it now. When they're done, Judd tells Lewis not to fill in his wife or daughter on what they did that night. They have to keep this a secret, just between the boys and their man hearts. The soil of a man's heart, Lewis, is... Stonia. Whoa, that's what that dead kid said the other day. Is that like a lyric or something? Lewis calls his daughter, and Dale Midkiff tries to convince us that he's trying to convince her that everything's okay. And kiss him goodnight for me. Yuck. Kiss your own cat. Maybe next time. Let's get a little bit of that baby acting, though. Hi, Daddy. I love you. Wow, he is cute as all get out. No wonder baby actor Miko Hughes would go on to be the kid in New Nightmare five years later. In fact, while kid characters are often played by twins, Ellie Creed, for example, is played by a pair, director Mary Lambert insisted on casting Miko even though he didn't have one because she knew he'd be the best three-year-old actor they could hope for. The next day, Church shows up and scares Lewis right into a Three Stooges routine. Eh, yeah, lousy cat. Why I oughta? Upon closer inspection of this adorable little kitty actor, Lewis notes how bad Church smells and sees that he chewed his way out of the bag. He also finds out that new Church isn't a nice kitty. <laughs> Lewis beers it up with Judd and asks him why his dead cat has come back to him. So Judd transitions into a flashback to when he was a little kid and had buried his dog Spot in the Micmac grounds, only for the dog to come back all growly and mean. The grave Lewis saw in the regular pet cemetery was when Judd buried Spot a second time, and where he thankfully stayed buried. Immediately, Lewis asks the most obvious question. Has anyone ever buried a person up there? <laughs> Christ on his throne, no. Well, sorry, Judd. I was just asking, okay? Apologies to everyone who apparently finds Dale Midkiff super hot, which is a surprisingly large number of people. Because I'm gonna skip over his little tubby time scene and get to when he picks his family up at the airport. What, right there on the tarmac? I thought that kind of meeting was only for ex-presidents and AGs. Ellie tells Lewis that she had a dream about Church getting killed and buried in the pet cemetery. But Lewis gaslights his daughter and tells her, nah, that shit ain't real. Oh yeah, Lewis? Then why Church smell like dumpster ass. I hate that smell. 
yeah, I hate jumps to ass smell too, kid. In case you forgot this was a kill count, let me remind you with a real random death. Missy the housekeeper can't stand her stomach cancer pain anymore, so she hangs herself in her basement. Yeah, it's completely out of nowhere, probably because this character was written in to replace Judd's wife, who is a whole nother heaping scoop of sadness in the book. Oh, and speaking of the book, here's the guy that wrote it, Mr. Stephen the King King, who cameos as a minister at Missy's funeral. Let me get an eye up for the master. Uh, I up. Missy's death inspires Ellie to ask her dad what he thinks happens after you die. I think we go on. Yeah. Yeah, nailed that line. Rachel, on the other hand, still has a hard time dealing with death, and she tells Lewis why in a flashback story. When she was young, her sister Zelda had spinal meningitis and was kept in the back of Rachel's house like a dirty secret. Zelda's physical deformity scared Rachel a whole bunch, and to make matters worse, Rachel was the only one home when Zelda died by choking to death on some food. Zelda's dead! Zelda's Denise Crosby gives an excellent dramatic voiceover for this scene. In fact, it's the best acting in the movie, done by anyone who's not Fred Gwynn or the baby. They'll say you hated her, Rachel, and that was true. And they'll say you wanted her to be dead, and that was true too. She gets a bit hysterical after reliving that trauma, but Lewis knows it's nothing that can't be fixed with a little Valium and a force push. Sometime later, the Creeds and Judd are enjoying a nice afternoon flying a kite up to the highest heights. I love the expansive nature you see in this movie. In fact, unlike other Stephen King adaptations up to this point, Pet Cemetery was actually filmed in Maine upon King's insistence, in the tiny town of Ellsworth, about half an hour away from Bangor, where King lives. Unfortunately, Fortunately for the Creeds, this idyllic main existence is about to be invaded by a semi-truck, which is headed towards their home, being driven by a dude who's way too busy rocking to the Ramones to pay any much attention to the route. So it'd be great if the Creeds could keep an eye on their youngest instead of getting distracted by Ellie and her sailor mouth. Alas, few things are more entertaining than a little kid swearing, so the parents aren't watching as Gage chases the kite string closer and closer to the road. Judd finally realizes what's happening, and what follows is legit one of the most tense and difficult to watch scenes ever. Especially after Lewis trips and you know he ain't gonna make it, cause he doesn't. And Gage Creed, the only kid to ever rival Andy Barkley in cuteness, gets run down by a big rig. Holy shit that is intense, and it garners the most impressive performance out of Dale Midkiff when he screams no in anguish. No! This movie's got plenty that doesn't impress me, but damn, that moment is powerful. The funeral is pretty painful to watch too, since Lewis's father-in-law punches him in the face and their fight causes the casket to fall and expose a bit of dead baby arm there. It's your son's funeral, get a hold of yourself, please! Dude, I am a hold of myself, that dick just punched me! At home, Ellie complains that God should make Gage come back. Judd tells her it doesn't work that way, but he already knows what Lewis must be thinking. You know, just by logicking it out. It's not like he could read anything in Lewis's blank face there. Are we sure he's not the one who died and came back? Yeah, Lewis is already considering another visit to the Micmac burial ground, even though the last time he did, it didn't turn out that great. That cat ain't right. Judd wags his finger at Lewis for even entertaining the idea, and admits that he lied when he said no one had ever buried a person up there before. Cue another flashback, this time telling the tale of Timmy Baderman, who was killed on his way home from WW Dose. Timmy's dad, Bill Baderman, buried his purple hard-earning son in the Micmac grounds, and before you know it, Timmy was up and about, eating legs? And pulling a real Romero on all the ladies in town. They're coming to get you, main girl. Because Timmy was a face flesh tearing abomination, Judd and his buds wound up going to the Baderman house to be a real bunch of Alphermen. They burned the building down in an attempt to kill the zombie, but since Timmy wasn't done hugging his dad quite yet, Bill ended up dying in the house fire as well. I'm counting Bill, but not Timmy, since we never knew human Timmy before he died off screen, so his kill didn't really happen in this movie, did it? And as far as undead Timmy goes, well, I'm not gonna count zombies at all, because that is one dangerous precedent. In any case, looks like a whole lot of problems were caused by bringing back the dead. Sometimes, Dad is better. Yeah, you could say that again, Judd. Well, sometimes, Dad is better. I, I didn't mean literally, but... Sometimes. That is better. Okay, we got it, dude. Rachel decides to take Ellie to her parents' house in Chicago, while Lewis hangs back to tie up loose ends regarding Gage. Ellie doesn't want to leave her dad alone, though, because she's been getting dream warnings from someone. Someone 
getting Pax Cow. Pax Cow? What? Is that like the new bovine mascot for Penny Arcade? It's a real sad moment for Lewis as he watches his family get on the plane, right? Is that, is that sadness? Yeah, maybe zoom in real hard and see if we can find any emotion there. Anything? No? Still nothing? Ah, forget it. In Chicago, Ellie keeps getting dream visits from Pascal, telling her that Lewis is gonna do something bad. She relays his zombie dream warning to Rachel through a bunch of snotty tears, but Rachel just can't figure out what the hell Pascal means. Pascal? Why do I know that name? Pascal. Pascal? Was she saying Pascal? <laughs> her phone a friend Lifeline was a dead guy. That's ironic, don't you think? Recognizing Pascal's name, she tries to call Lewis. And when she's unable to reach him, her mother tries to quell her qualms. Probably went out for a hamburger or a chicken dinner, dear. You know how men are when they're alone. <laughs> yeah, you know how us guys be. When the wife is away, it's meat eating time. She calls up Judd, interrupting his mustard dinner, and asks him to keep an eye on Lewis, which he agrees to do. I, uh, I mean, it's not like it's a hard task for the guy, it just means relocating his beer drinking and cigarette smoking to the front porch. During all this, Lewis has broken into the cemetery and by now has dug up Gage's casket. After cradling the corpse for a mo, he heads home to bury that boy, sneaking past Judd with ease since the old feller wound up sleeping on the job. I, uh... Lewis carries Gage over the deadfall and into the blue zone, which is extra active tonight with the sounds of roaring and maniacal laughter. What is that place, frickin' Arkham? It's also got a whole bunch of fog and falling trees, so maybe don't go camping in the blue zone, yo. Hey, you know what? We keep hearing all these evil roars. Could we maybe get a glimpse at the beings who produce them? Oh shit, never mind, dude. They can go on just being noises, my beat. Meanwhile, Rachel has been having nightmares about her sister Zelda and starring in her very own sitcom called My Friend the Ghost. Because all of a sudden, Victor Pascal is a comic relief spirit. Man, I've had it with these motherfucking ghosts on this motherfucking plane. Victor's comedy craps all over this third act as he delays a gate closing for Rachel's transfer flight and even helps her rent a car? What the fuck? I will say, however, that his makeup is very good good, and I even have an extended fun fact about it. You see, the makeup effects in this movie were primarily done by two people. Lance Anderson, who had worked at Stan Winston Studios and helped out with effects on The Thing, and his son, David Leroy Anderson, who would go on to win Academy Awards alongside Rick Baker for doing makeup effects on Men in Black and The Nutty Professor. David also designed most of the monsters in Cabin in the Woods, and some notable TV horror creations like Twisty the Clown from American Horror Story and The Red Devil from Scream Queen. And I'm not quite done with this fun fact yet, because Lance and David founded the makeup and design company AFX Studio, which is now run by, just fucking wait for it, David and his wife Heather Langenkamp Anderson, aka Nancy from A Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, y'all, Nancy Thompson helped create all those nightmare monsters in Cabin in the Woods. So it's kinda crazy that Miko Hughes here ended up playing Heather's son in New Nightmare, cause she would've married David right after he did all the makeup on this movie. Horror's the freaking best, man. Okay, back to this movie. In opposition to Pascal's benevolent spiritual guidance is the cemetery itself, whose powers cause Rachel to get a flat tire on her way back home. It's trying to stop you. Do you hear me? It's trying to stop you! Yeah, the cemetery has its own powers. Or maybe it's the Wendigo's curse? I don't know, man. It's a Stephen King story. Just roll with the magical realism. Rachel gets herself out of this pickle by hitchhiking down the same kind of truck that killed her baby. Sure you don't want to wait for the next ride, lady? Lewis buries Gage in the Micmac grounds and goes back home, where he collapses in the bed without even taking his dirty-ass shoes off. His baby plant sprouts right away and walks all the way home in his little muddy shoes. His zombie cat faithfully at his Side. Gage goes into his dad's medical kit and takes out a scalpel, a perfect weapon for him since it's like a butcher knife but baby size. Judd wakes up from his beer nap and follows some muddy baby footprints into his house, where he's tormented by baby giggles and toddler threats. <laughs> Judd goes upstairs, and while he's distracted by Church the Accomplice Cat, Gage comes out from under the bed and slices into Judd's Achilles tendon? Oh, damn, that's some hostile shit. All of a sudden, this movie gets super bloody, as angry baby Gage falls upon Judd with a scalpel and slits his mouth open. Ah, yeah. Then, after the old man collapses to the ground, Gage sinks his baby teeth into Judd's neck and has himself a little flesh feast, ripping out Judd's throat to seal the deal on this gnarly kill. That zombie baby is 
is ruthless, yo! Rachel gets home, and thankfully, Pascal says he's not allowed to go any further, so he stays in the truck and disappears goodbye. We won't be missing you, dude. Instead of going home, Rachel is drawn to Judd's house by Gage's baby giggles, but once she's inside, it's a different noise she hears. Moaning from Zelda, who she finds crouched in the corner of a room, threatening to twist Rachel's back and leave her paralyzed. Never get out of bed again! NEVER GET OUT OF BED AGAIN! But don't worry, Rachel, Zelda's not actually there. It's only <laughs> show-stopping Gage? What? Who dressed this kid up like a thrift store Mad Hatter? He's actually dressed like a portrait in Rachel's family home. I guess the evil spirit did that to better emotionally manipulate the poor woman. Oh, and look, the portrait's got a little church-looking cat in it, too. That's nice. Gage says he has a present for Mommy and approaches her at maximum toddler speed. And because we hear a stab and Rachel scream, I'm gonna put her on the count right now. Murdered by her own little undead dead child. Lewis wakes up in a pratfall the next morning. Wow, how did he not gouge his eye out there? And sees evidence that Gage has returned and looted Lewis's man bag. He gets a call from his undead son, and it's honestly super unsettling. First I played with dad, then mommy came, and I played with mommy. Now I want to play with you. Lewis heads over all wide-eyed and angry to Judd's house, where he wins Church's trust with a stake, only to grab this poor cat actor by the scruff of its neck and stick it in the butt with some poison. Oh man, this cat actor's death acting is making me feel bad. And Lewis's taunting isn't doing anything to help. Lie down. Play dead. Be dead! With one zombie taken care of, Lewis heads into the house, which is all of a sudden covered in mold for some reason. Pretty fucking wackadoo, but if you think this is random and crazy, just wait for Pet Cemetery 2. You ain't seen nothing yet. The mold spell only ends after Lewis picks up Rachel's Cinderella shoe, and with the house back to normal, Lewis prepares to re-kill his son. He goes upstairs and finds Judd's seriously fucked up face, for real man, when this movie gets so hardcore, and then walks into the hallway where he gets boo scared by his wife's hanging body. Yo, how'd a baby get a full grown ass woman up in the attic like that? Oh, maybe because he has scary baby doll now. Oh, the doll fell down. And now he's back to human. Back to doll. Back to human. Scary doll. <laughs> That's fun. Gage slashes and stabs at Lewis with the scalpel before his father manages to toss him to the ground. Cause like, you know, he is still a baby. When Gage goes to get him again, Lewis just grabs the toddler and sticks him in the neck with his goodnight juice. Aw, poor Gage. Oh my god, look at those big watery eyes. No fair. No fair, no fair. That kid is the cutest little murderer I've ever- Oh, um, did that kid just hit his head? Gage dies once again, and Lewis takes a metal can of gasoline to the entirety of Judd's house. He lights it all up and burns it all down, even the baby doll he once called the son. For this house fire, they actually built a two-story facade on top of a real house that they fireproofed, and then they just burned the shell down. Pretty cool. Lewis doesn't leave his wife's body to burn, and not even Victor and his above-the-fingertip shorts can convince the grieving widower to stop his crazy plan of walking through ghosts. Er, of burying his wife in the Micmac grounds. What do you have to say about that, Victor? No! Too bad. Lewis carries Rachel down the trail and buries her off screen, and that night she breaks out of her grave while Fred Gwynn narrates a nice little wrap-up poem. Man grows what he can, and he tends it. Because what you buy is what you own. Rachel gets home all bloody and dirty, but Lewis don't mind. He down to get gritty with it. Oh no, dude, watch the pause. The movie ends with Rachel grabbing a knife and killing Lewis with it, although we don't get to see it since the movie cuts to black before it happens. But he does scream, <laughs> so I think it's safe to count him. How many people were left better off dead? Let's take Lucy and find out at the numbers, Ah, uh, yup. Eight people died in Pet Cemetery, not including cats or zombies, or zombie cats. The victims included three women, four grown men, and one little baby boy. But, you know, no extra pie wedge for that. With a runtime of 103 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 12.88 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Judd, obviously. The effects here are just more exceptional work from the Andersons. Great family to marry into, Heather. You're in the wrong business if you don't love blood. Doll machete for lamest kill will go to Missy, who just couldn't hang in there with the stomach crabs. And that's it. Pet Cemetery came out in 1989, and there's a remake slash reinterpretation of the book coming out in just a few weeks on April 5th. There's also a batshit crazy sequel starring Clancy Brown that we'll look at next week, but until then I'm James A. Janice, 
This has been the Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Justice Maddox Wilbur, Gabe Schill, Devontae Parchman, and Joe Croft. I also want to thank Lucy for being the best little kitty cat. Thank you, Lucy. Also, definitely want to thank my assistant editors, Bree and Zorin, for all the work they do. And Clara, who does my graphics over at my YouTube network, Made In. Made In actually sent me this custom golden chainsaw trophy for hitting 2 million subscribers. Seriously, Kevin, Keith, Amelia, Brad, Michael, everyone there, thank you so much. And everyone else, be good people.